today is car wash day. We like Johnson City. It's a really cool old town. So much history, the city's beautiful. And we picked this specific RV park because it had laundry, which we desperately need, and for the showers and Wi-Fi. It's hot, it's 88 degrees. Mm -hmm. We have no clothes. We need to <laughs> wash some clothes and take some showers to kind of restart or jump into Alaska. So we get our spot, we get situated, I sort out the laundry, we go down to the laundromat. They close it at 9 p.m., whether they're down or not. Okay, all right, that's disappointing. I'll wash a few things in the sink. It's hot enough, I'll set them out to dry. Hopefully they'll be dry by morning, right? Mm -hmm. So then we decide, okay, we'll stop at the wash house to check them. Both of the showers have tape on the doorknob saying out of order, no hot water. I say no, I'm just done. I'm not paying $29 to park in a gravel parking lot to sleep. We go into the office and apparently the power's out for some reason. Which they can't control. No. But still. But they should have backup generators for their office so they can at least run the credit card machine if someone wants to leave or give cash back. Can't even open the cash register. Yeah, that was the best one. Well, you paid with the credit card so we can't give you a refund. I'll take cash. Oh, we can't open the cash register. Because we just don't have power. <laughs> Figure it out. Luckily, oh. she did. <laughs> yeah. This one lady So to be fair, they, they made it right. They didn't fight us. Yeah, and we're not going to name good. names. I'm not going to tell you who this is. But Mama's done. Yeah, Mama's done. Well, the other side of it is, is they have a laundry map, right? But there are so many people living, living here in this RV park that it just stays full the whole time. They lock the door at 9 p.m. Yeah. That's my biggest thing. I'm like, you should stay open as I mean, long as you want to. people don't even get to a campground by, you know, 5 or 6 o'clock. So, yeah. Oh, well. That's okay. Let's hook up and this go is, somewhere else. This is the first time ever, Evolution, we are leaving the campground that we decided to stay in. And got a refund. So we did get cash, so. Got cash. We needed cash anyhow, so. Okay. That's good. Now let's go drive into the night and find place to stay. Luckily we got plenty of daylight. <laughs> All right so our first campground was a failure to launch but now we are at the I think it's a Klondike River campground just outside of Dawson City. Much better setting. Much friendlier setting. So Caroline's already made friends with those folks over there and <laughs> surprise surprise. <laughs> We're going to do a little bit of laundry and hang it up on our Tennessee special clothesline over there. That's what I grew up on. And uh, yeah, we're just going to sit right here for a day or so. What are you doing? I'm washing some clothes. Why is that? Because the other accommodations did not work out. Yeah? Yeah. And Caroline ran out of panties. Okay. I'm washing a couple other things to at least get us by yeah. if it cools off on our way to Fairbanks. Gotcha. But we'll see. <laughs> what you doing? Playing. Some pretty cool stuff you got set up over there. So I want to take a minute and talk to you guys. So I want to take a minute and talk to you guys about our cleanup, regrouping, sorting day. We usually try and do this about every two weeks and then once a month do a serious overhaul of cleaning out the car, cleaning out the trailer, 
doing all the laundry of the sheets and blankets, camp blankets, jackets, coats, just to freshen everything up. Today, we are doing just a two week straighten up cleanup. We're getting ready to go across the border into Alaska. So we wanna make sure that everything's in order, everything's cleaned up, just in case for the odd scenario that they feel like they need to go through our stuff. It happens, we'd rather be ready for it rather than being embarrassed or wondering where certain things are. <laughs> So today we are basically really cleaning out and reorganizing the car. That's the place that seems to get the messiest and the most cluttered because of getting in and out, tossing things in there last minute before going to bed, just being in a hurry, throwing things in there. So first we're going to clean out the car. And for us, that means that we are pulling everything out. Luckily, we're in a campground that has a giant picnic table, so we're gonna utilize that by pulling everything out, putting it on the table, and making sure to put things back where they actually belong. One thing about traveling, especially in such small capacity, is that you have to be organized. I'm already type A, I like to be organized, and especially living now in a smaller space than before in our fifth wheel camper, things have to be in their place all of the time. Otherwise, I go a little bonkers. One cool thing that we have that at first I kind of thought was kind of silly to get is a little vacuum, little hand vacuum. That thing is such a lifesaver, specifically for the car seat. Caroline might snack. She might play with paper or pull off stickers. It is so nice to be able to pull that bad boy out clean out her car seat, and even be able to vacuum out some portions of the car too. With all of the rain that we've had, and especially driving on the dumpster, it's dusty, muddy, dirty, basically. So when we do a one month giant clean out, which I'll probably talk to you guys about in the next week or so when we're in Fairbanks doing that, uh, is when I do all of like the laundry. So right now we have a lot of laundry to do. And because I already have a place booked for us to with a washer and dryer, I only did a little bit to get us by on what we needed for the next couple days as we drive to Fairbanks. Otherwise, the trailer doesn't really need to be touched. We keep that pretty organized and everything has to go in its right place or doors won't shut, drawers won't close. So the trailer is pretty set as it is. We may rearrange a few things or we may take some things out or add some more things back in since there's a little more space. But otherwise, the trailer doesn't need to be touched. It's usually the formatter that needs all of the work. After taking care of our camp chores, we decided to make our way into Dawson City and take a turn about the town, as I imagine the old miners used to say. Having always been intrigued by the Gold Rush era, I was more than a little excited to see this historical ground zero of the Klondike Gold Rush. Dawson City came into being at the confluence of the Yukon and Klondike Rivers. What was once a meeting place for First Nations people, centuries before, quickly grew into a city almost overnight with the discovery of gold on Bonanza Creek in 1896. Word soon spread south and the infamous Klondike Gold Rush was on. By 1898, over 40,000 people had made the long and dangerous journey north, quickly turning Dawson City into a bustling hub of commerce and entertainment for the gold miners and entrepreneurs seeking their fortunes in the Great White North. As we were exploring the Dawson City Museum, a portrait of three men caught my eye and I nearly dropped the camera when I read the description. But wait, there's more to this story. Let's rewind a bit to a few weeks before. So we're driving along 
and I pull up this paper map that I was able to find at a sporting goods store. It just happened to notice a place called McHouston River. Well, my last name is McHouston, and pretty much all McHoustons are related. So we tried to find out more information. There was a house there, but it didn't look uh, too inviting. A lot of no trespassing signs, and I didn't see anybody outside. And uh, also on that map is a, a little marker that says McHouston Historical Site. I was like, oh man, we got to figure out what this is all about. But we drove up in the woods on a couple little trails and just couldn't come up with anything. But still, pretty cool. We're going to have to Google that when we get back to Signal. Needless to say, the thought of stumbling across one of my ancestors here in the Yukon never even crossed my mind. But here he was, staring me in the eye with that confidence and sage wisdom that only a hardy pioneer can pull off. It would seem that somewhere in our family genes, there's a strain of adventurer blood that can't help but wonder. Originally from New Hampshire, Jack McHouston was wild at heart from an early age and traveled his way up the Pacific coast, working as a prospector, miller, and Hudson Bay Company employee on his quest northward. In 1873, Jack came to the Yukon with his partners Arthur Harper and Alfred Mayo. After enduring his first harsh winter in the Yukon, he and his partners established a trading post at Fort Reliance, about six miles from what is now Dawson City, and over the next eight years developed a chain of trading posts along the Yukon River, including 40 Mile, 60 Mile, Stewart City, Eagle, Circle City, and Fort Yukon. In this quickly changing territory, there was no formal law enforcement. So leaders of the community gathered together and created what is now called the Yukon Order of Pioneers. Jack was elected as their first president and designated their own golden rule paraphrase, do as you would be done by, as their motto. This group of men voluntarily took on the task of ensuring mutual protection and order for the growing populace. The order settled disputes, took care of the sick, and raised funds to send ill or injured men back to Vancouver or Victoria for treatment. While Jack McHuston left his mark on this territory in many ways, it is clear in surviving historical documents and letters that his honesty and integrity was what gave rise to his fame in the Yukon. It wasn't uncommon for him to grubstake destitute miners who arrived penniless after having lost everything just to make it to the Yukon Territory. He would outfit them and send them on their way with only a handshake promise that the favor would be made right when the miner returned from the gold fields. After 25 years in the Yukon, Jack McHuston retired a wealthy man when his successful trading businesses and mining speculations were cashed out. He was one of the few who returned south with pockets full of gold and stories of adventure that modern day explorers can only dream about. There's another famous Jack associated with this region. And if you've ever read The Call of the Wild or watched White Fang, you know who I'm talking about. Jack London wrote many books about the North Country and became friends with Jack McHouston when they met in 1898. Years later, London often visited him in his Berkeley, California mansion after returning from the Yukon. You can find several mentions of him as well as several landmarks named in his honor in a few of Jack London's books. My limited research of Jack McHouston has only scratched the surface of his trials, tribulations, and tales during his time on this earth. Fortunately, a great amount of research and effort has been put into authoring a book which documents his life by James A. McHouston and is called Captain Jack McHouston, Father of the Yukon. For years, I've been drawn to the stories of the gold rush. As a kid, I devoured any book I could get my hands on that told stories of fortunes won and lost at the mercies of the wilderness. I often dreamed of what it must have felt like to be one of the first prospectors to find handfuls of nuggets along a stream. Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine that one of my relatives had actually lived the adventure and unknowingly left behind a treasure trove of history that this modern day adventure seeker would stumble across nearly 150 years later. As I walked the streets of Dawson City, the realization that I was literally walking in the footsteps of my adventurous ancestor gave me goosebumps. I had to think that perhaps this was all meant to be. Perhaps this course we've set, this lifestyle we've pursued, isn't such a crazy road to travel after all. All this time, I thought I knew about the cold rush. As it turns out, I didn't know Jack.
good morning. So today we wrap up our stay in Canada, at least for the time being. We're gonna go down to Dawson City one last time, grab us a little bit of coffee, some breakfast, just because we slept in a little bit, we don't feel like cooking. So we have the opportunity, we're gonna get some food and sustenance made by someone else. And then we're gonna get on the road and probably here in about an hour, we'll be crossing back into the US, into Alaska. So here we go. So the whole time we were in the States, we didn't stay in a single campground since we left Phoenix. Right. We didn't pay for a single camping spot. Mm -mm. Then we got to Canada, things got a little complicated. We made it a little while through BC, wild camping. And then we found out that the uh, Yukon campgrounds have firewood, free firewood, pre-cut, already included with your camping fee which is only 12 bucks Canadian which is like eight or nine bucks American that's really not that bad no. it saves us from having to uh, dig a toilet latrine and all that kind of stuff plus it's been like a really cool community because most people are travelers as well we met a bunch of overlanders I'm gonna run down there and grab our receipt real quick um, but yeah campgrounds in the Yukon way to go yeah, they are. up another inspection pulled up showed our passports showed up showed our documentation for our shotgun and within 60 seconds gone that was easy yeah so we'll keep those going yeah your house, guys. <laughs> so now we're on our way to Fairbanks probably gonna stop halfway somewhere and camp out for the night but uh we finally got some cooler temperatures at 66 instead of 86. 86. Yeah. So we're feeling pretty good. And this is beautiful. This is top of the world highway that connects Dawson City to Chicken. Yeah. Uh, Chicken, Alaska. So just an awesome ride. Awesome, awesome ride. So side trip, we're headed to Eagle. Is it called Eagle? Yeah, Eagle Village. Eagle Village, which is a diversion north. We had some friends, or I should say some folks in the campground that said they came up this way and saw a herd of caribou you could not see the end of. They said it covered the road for about, what, two miles? I don't, I don't know what that is. And they, they said that it was just unbelievable, so we gotta go see that. Let's see if we can find some caribou. Go find caribou. But it's a, it's an inn, 
back out road. There's not a, uh, it's not a pass through, so we still got a little bit of fuel um, left in the fuel tanks, so we should be able to make it up and make it back. Fingers crossed. And there might even be fuel in Eagle, but we're just trying to find the caribou at this point. Then we'll figure the rest out. So let's go find a caribou. All right. Just keep trying to kill your goals. I keep catching my reflection, restless from the outside, feeling it. Oh, we live to be just. What in the world? Whatever it is. See the scale rust on it? All done. Mom. Mom. Was the was it worth the nail in your tire? No, not really. <laughs> no. So yeah, we had a our first flat of the trip had nothing to do with the quality of the tire and everything to do with the obstacle it tried to drive over. But with the ARB kit, we were patched up and on the road in no time. Get yours today. Link in this video description. <laughs> so we're going to get on down the road, 
go find camp for the night. Hopefully by a stream where we can pan for some gold. Maybe. There's a stream. While Eagle Alaska was interesting, we were all tired, stinky, and just a bit annoyed from too many days without showers or fresh laundry. We were looking forward to making Fairbanks the next day for a long rest and reset. The past few days had worn us all down with the late summer heat, campground issues in Dawson City, and now a flat tire. Just when it seemed like long hot showers and springtime fresh clothing was within our grasp, a massive caribou jumped out of the underbrush just a few feet ahead of the rig and Sarah locked up all six wheels to minimize the impact. Fortunately, we missed the caribou and after catching our breath, we started again to find camp for the night. Almost immediately, our dash cluster went haywire from yet another issue. Well, that's what I was wondering, did it just go off because of that, or? I've never seen this before. Zero faults. So we've got something going on with the forerunner. This is the first time we've ever seen this issue. We've got the four-wheel drive indicators flashing, multi-terrain, uh, traction control, all this stuff is lit up. But I have no fault codes coming through the system right now. Everything seems to be functioning just fine. So we have no choice right now but to ease our way to cell signal and uh, see what we can research real quick. Thankfully, we aren't at Tuk Toy Yuk Tuk. We're actually, you know, just a few hours from Fairbanks, so hopefully we can get some help there if, uh, if we can't clear this up ourselves. Probably what I'll do tonight, um, is, for, for starters, is I'll disconnect the battery and just give that computer a good uh, reset and see if it doesn't some of this stuff up but we're just going to keep an eye on it. 